Hi, everybody. Welcome to Tenant Talk Live. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to February's Tenant Talk Live, everybody. Feel free to drop your name in the chat and where you're joining us from. Recording in progress. Oh, and if you can, thank you so much um, to whoever <laughs> that was. But just a reminder, if you're not speaking, to please mute yourself. But hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. We'll give it a few minutes for folks to join. Awesome. We have Alice joining us from Dayton, Ohio. Welcome, Alice. Hi, Dr. Bambi. Dr. Bambi's joining us from Georgia. We have AJ joining us from Wisconsin. Tiffany from Oregon. Welcome, welcome, folks. Thanks for joining February 10 Talk Live. Hi, Chris from uh, St. Petersburg. Monica joining us from Georgia, and V joining us from Springfield. Hi, Sunshine. Sunshine's joining us from Tennessee. <clears throat> I see some familiar faces too from last week or from last month. Welcome to the folks that are returning. We have uh, Sandra from Virginia, Sam from Nevada. We have Pam from New Jersey. Welcome, welcome, everybody. We'll give it another minute or so. Awesome. We have Jocelyn from Georgia. And Chris, to answer your question, we're not meeting twice a month, um, just for the time currently. For the foreseeable future, I will say. <laughs> And yeah, we have Brooke from Michigan, Anna from California. Hi, Coach Ron. Coach Ron is just wishing everybody um, or asking how everybody's doing today. Awesome. Okay, I think it's slowing down a little bit, so I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, again, thank you everybody for being here. Feel free to continue introducing yourselves um, in the chat today. And I'll just ask Courtney if you can help me with the waiting room, that would be awesome. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Again, this is Tenant Talk Live. Thank you for everyone who's joining. Um, today we're gonna be talking about, um, you know, just being, uh, a public official and those that are interested in learning more about that. Um, for folks that are new here, my name is Sid Betancourt and I use she, they pronouns uh, and I'm a project manager for inclusive community engagement at NLHC. And for anyone who again is new or needs a refresher, you're currently joining Tenant Talk Live where we provide opportunities for residents to connect with NLHC but also to one another to share best practices and to learn more about how they can be involved in federal advocacy and leading in their communities. And then just as a reminder for folks who might be new as well, we always record these meetings and then we upload them to YouTube afterwards. Uh, so for today's meeting, we'll be um, learning from some really impressive leaders. We have Bella Knight who did a recorded interview and she's from California. We also have Miracle Fletcher um, from Georgia, and we're going to learn about their experiences as did officials. Awesome. Thank you so much. And just a reminder, folks, to stay muted unless you're talking. And um, unfortunately, Zella Knight wasn't here to meet us um, live, so we do have a recorded interview with her. But if you want to connect with her after this call, we'll have her email in the chat for you a few times throughout the call. Uh, but I will begin by sharing our community agreements from the last time we met. Um, <clears throat> so we put these together last month. Um, so if you have any additional feedback for these, you're always welcome to email them to myself. Um, and feel free to drop some thoughts in the chat too if you have them. But the first rule we have is the platinum rule, so treating others 
the way they want to be treated. In other words, please consider how others might want to be treated and how that might differ from how you want to be treated. Uh, we also have muting your mic except when speaking, listening with an open mind and empathy. And then we had taking up space and giving space to others as well. And then um, one important conversation that we had during the last call was just a reminder that this uh, meeting is recorded and shared online. So if there's anything that you would feel uncomfortable sharing in a public space, um, just be mindful of that as you um, interact here. But yeah. Cool. So again, if you have any feedback on those or you want to add anything, feel free to email me. And then this is a reminder if you're signed up for NLHC emails, you should be receiving an email this Friday called The Connection. And this e-blast will have all of our recap materials. So it'll have the recording, it'll have the chat um, saved, it'll have any links that we share on that um, recap. And we're also going to um, share last month's recap email in the chat so you have that as well. And then before I show the pre-recorded interview with our guest, Ella Knight, we're gonna just cover some logistics really fast. So just please make sure if you have any questions that you write them in the chat and later in the call, we'll also bring some folks off mute if you prefer to do that instead. Um, but we just ask that you stay muted if you're not speaking. But yeah, thank you everybody. I'll go ahead and share my screen so that we can see the pre-recorded interview that we have with Selenite. part of the Residents United Networking. Hello, everybody, and hello to Zella Knight for joining us. Uh, Zella is joining us today um, from California. She is a tenant commissioner for, with the formerly homeless and homeless representing them in the LA County Development Authority. Uh, and Ms. Zella Knight is also part of the Residents United Network in California, serving as President Emeritus. But thank you for joining us, Stella. Um, feel free to add on anything that I missed. We're not gonna add anything on. I, I love what I do and I do what I do. So thanks, Ed. Yeah, and thank you for joining us to talk um, about your experience um, in the local office. I know a lot of folks are eager to learn and I know um, you're sad you couldn't make it, but we're excited to hear from your wisdom. So I'll go ahead and get us started. So why did you decide to get involved in local office? And were there any mentors that supported you in that process? Oh, um, that's a great that's a great question. So um, I'm ingrained in in the aspect of service ancestrally. And so the many mentors that I have in my life, both past, present, and future, um, lead, led me to the path of uplifting the voices of those who live the experience, who are living the experience, and who should be part of the informed decision-making process. And so through that labor of love, um, I sought or was sought out to participate in the informed decision-making um, process. And that what led me to my current role as a tenant commissioner uh, representing the formerly homeless and homeless uh, at the LA CDA. Awesome, thank you so much. And I know it, this will kind of look different um, depending on the location, but can you tell us a little bit about the steps that you took in order to prepare for your campaign or just like building those connections? Wow, the uh, the interesting aspect for me is that um, through the various um, service windows that I participate in, in a variety of areas, I was attending a, a coordinating council meeting with both our city um, and our county, as well as other partners and agencies. And one of um, my partners in crime uh, whispered in my ear and said, hey, because of your lived experience and because of your knowledge and because of your skill, I think this would be a great position for you to be suited in. And so I listened intently to her. Um, 
found it uh, an interesting opportunity and time for me to participate. And so um, there was an application process, fill out the application, um, then went through uh, interview process the same way that you do in corporate America, went through the um, interview process, uh, subsequently was selected, um, appointed by our county board of supervisors, and here I am. Yeah, there's like a lot of different processes. Did you ever face like any opposition through that process or after it and how did you overcome it? I, I think the one of the areas of concern is in, in the resident world, do residents really truly understand the full breadth of policy and law? Do they truly understand um, protocol and process? And so, you know, that was always the, uh, positioning as well as, you know, that power shift, that power dynamic that, okay, you know, is our residents really truly or should be part of this process? And so um, just doing what I do in, in the um, aspect of living the experience and understanding process and procedure and understanding policy and law, just uh, explained it in the best way again um, making the requirement of centering residents in informed decision making and making sure that they're embedded. We are embedded um, in that process. And so uh, that's a win that I was successful with. Yeah, and that's like that's a really big deal too. And I, I admire your ability to like continuously push for that in every and <laughs> everything and the work that we do together. I know we work really closely. Um, but in terms of just working with folks where you're located right now, how did you build a coalition of supporters to help you out? Again, the lived experience was the centerpiece. Um, having the experience of being homeless and housing insecure, um, as well as being a housing choice voucher participant, I, I was able to, again, bring forth the lives of a resident, what they endure, what's going on, where we would like to be. And so bringing, the, bringing the, that aspect forward from the lived experience lens um, made, up, made, up, made up a lot of great conversations, helped us to do a lot of deep dive analysis in areas that we didn't really think of before. And so again, um, pushing that needle and that envelope for better lives and better community. That's what centering residents in, in this process is all about. Yeah, and there's like, there's a lot of power in the people themselves. So, you know, it's, it's good what you're doing, empowering everyone to also do that same advocacy for themselves and for the greater, the greater community. Hey, I'm just one of one of many. And so in the, as we connect the dots or put the pieces to the puzzle together in building that traction again, and that's what makes better communities and better lives. Exactly. Very well said. <laughs> um, so I want to make sure I don't miss um, an important question here, but once you were in this um, position and in office, what surprised you the most? Mm. I think the, the piece that surprised me the most is, again, that stigma that is associated with residents and others living the experience. And so even though we have the greatest intent in policy, we sometimes put those subtle elements in that really truly um, lift up the stigmas and bring those into a realm and place that um, really is not appropriate in some instances. And so having to really truly flush that out and bring forth that dynamic uh, that was a fun undertaking to do, um, but again, it it led to great progress. It led to strengthening programs. It led to strengthening resources. It most importantly centered the tenants and the residents in regards to what their needs are. It's it brought forth more resident leadership which is critical um, again in the lived experience realm and again breaking these um, 
systems and structures and other elements that create an inequity. So shifting that power to whereas we had a fair and equal playing field was critical. Yeah, and that's it's ongoing work for sure. I think there's like a lot of policies that just need to be <laughs> kind well, of assessed and looked at again. <laughs> Yes, there's thousands of policies that we, again, need to um, flush out and bring into the current. Many of them are antiquated. And so that work we still um, do today. Yeah. Um, so I think it kind of, again, focusing on your lived experience, um, how do you think like that experience itself and through your activism and your organizing prepare you for being a public uh, official? Ooh, that's a that's a great question, Sid, and it's it's a complex question. Simply put, you know, living the experience, and so you you want to bring others to walk in your shoes and look in from that lens, and then take apart or add to those policies that again create either create a deficit or where we can enhance and strengthen if we center every informed decision-making process and every decision based upon lived experience, based upon needs from that lens, then again, we build better communities and better lives. After all, the, the basic element to this, to this thing called life is life itself and the people in it. And so that is what our decisions and our values should be based on. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. I was muted, but I was saying yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I very much agree with that sentiment. So uh, I know you talked a lot about centering like resident voices and centering that lived experience. And I imagine that that was probably one of the biggest like priorities within your work. But are there any other top priorities that you were focusing on in office? And what have you been able to accomplish so far? Uh, I, I think the currently the biggest the biggest aspect that I think all of us, but especially those living the experiences focused on, we need more resources. We need more accountability. We need more enforcement. We need more monitoring. Um, those elements are critical in in the in the lives that we are attempting to save and desire to save and should be saving. And so um, from the federal standpoint, and again, we, we know what we're dealing with, we want to shape the narrative to remind everybody that lives are at stake. And so as lives are at stake, we need to pour in those values that we say that we believe in. And so again, um, in the housing realm, we need more housing choice vouchers. We, we see the numbers um globally now in regards to a number of folks who are unhoused and living in deplorable conditions we need to address those um in addition to that of course the, you know the funding is important we need that we need that to come as quickly as possible we saw with our public health emergency covid we saw how quickly we were able to get in crisis mode and bring all of those resources and other supports down in the effort to make sure others' lives were not impacted. That's the same element we need to take in every day um, pursuit of what we, we need. So those are one of the many things that um, working and striving to work to do, along with the important piece of lifting up residents and tenants um, in the aspect of serving federally, state, and locally at these decision-making tables in the effort, again, um, to uplift and bring the collective forward um, in saving those lives. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And then I, I just have one last question for you and just um, calling for one more piece of your wisdom. But if you had any advice that you would share with another tenant that's considering running for office, what would you share with them? Ooh, do it. Your voice matters. Your skill matters. Your concern matters. Your issues matter. And your lived experience especially matters. And so 
in this journey called life again. It is important for you to step up, step in, and don't worry about the naysayers or the negative, just do it. Exactly. And that's that's really, really solid advice. So thank you again, Zella, for your time and for being a part of this conversation. Um, is it okay if we share your contact information with everyone afterwards? Absolutely. 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 Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for taking the moment to watch that <laughs> with us. Um, and I hope somebody learned something from that interview and feel free to drop something you took away from that video in the chat. Um, again, since Ella wasn't able to be here, we'll drop her email and Courtney just dropped it in the chat so you can get in contact with her. And we'll also put it in the um, follow up email as well. But now I have the very distinct honor of presenting our second guest, Miracle Fletcher. Miracle Fletcher is um, an Atlanta native with a professional background in education, mental health services and case management. She is a mother advocate and organizer who is driven by her personal experiences to improve her community. Um, and she's also a housing commissioner in Atlanta. So Miracle, I'll go ahead and let you take it away and talk about your experience before opening it up for questions from the audience. Awesome. Hello, everyone on this call. Um, I send everybody love, light, and major blessings. Um, thank you. Uh, just like she said, I am a native of Atlanta. Um, and my own fight brought me to this forefront of the platform of being a strong housing advocate here in Georgia. Um, well, I first started organizing um, in Trust and Trees um, Tennis Association um, with fellow residents that actually <laughs> live in our community. And we realized that we had limited to no access to um, anyone that was willing to listen and hold accountability for the habitability of the households that we were actually living in. So we kind of got together, we organized, um, and understanding that because we were in a public-based rental assistance um, program funded by HUD, we had our right to organize and form a tenants association. So the power in understanding, you know, who you are, where you are, and that you're significant. Um, just like Zella was saying on the recording, um, our power is in our voice. If we're living in inhabitable conditions, if we're living in unsafe conditions, um, then potentially that leaves you where you're disadvantaged. So being informed and educating yourself on actual policies and what it takes to actually go into creating a bill and creating on a citywide level, creating legislation um, is very, very important. And it's very significant in us creating programs that are actually gonna be representative, representative of the needs of our communities. Um, so I partnered and the Tennis Association and Trussell Tree um, actually was under Housing Justice League and the Senate Working Group there also came together and we created a bill, which is um, which at the time was the Tenant Bill of Rights. And the Tenant Bill of Rights actually gave us headway into policy and getting um, some actual legislation in place um, to actually prevent, you know, landlords from abusing, you know, not just tenants in low income housing. A lot of times, you know, we are advocating for us because we are mostly disadvantaged people, um, minority, low income fam families are very disadvantaged, but understanding that tenant rights um, play a major role for everyone, whether you're in market rent. So understanding policy and understanding that we as tenants, we as people with lived experience of homelessness, drug abuse, you know, any type of deficit um, that, you know, society says that we have in our communities actually makes us the experts. Um, so we got together and we created a bill based upon all of the things that we were hearing everyone say and everyone talk about um, the fact that, you know, we needed the right to cure. Um, also, one of the ma major significant things was we saw here in Atlanta in the courthouse, there is no there was no place where tenants could actually go and, you know, get help and actually learn the eviction process because, you know, landlords, land developers, you know, across the country are 
monopolizing the fact that we have no legislation in place that prevents a rent cap. So understanding that we needed that for um, the tenants, not just for the low income, yet again, I'm going to say that this is for everyone because the pandemic showed us that, you know, at any given time, you know, things can change in your income, which will make you, you know, be in a situation where, you know, you don't have any resources. So us coming together, forming the Tenant Bill of Rights um, gave me the opportunity to actually get in front of city council. It gave me an opportunity to understand, you know, budgeting and the federal funding that is being allocated to the state of Georgia and also the city of Atlanta. So from that, I was actually appointed. I didn't run for the office. I was appointed to be the, um, the Atlanta City Council Housing Commissioner for the city of Atlanta for districts one through four being the voice and representative for all of our low income families in the city of Atlanta. So being instrumental in doing that also gave me the opportunity to be in meetings um, to actually be the voice for us to make sure that even though legislation is being created that we're not overlooked. So going through that process, I was able to negotiate um, with the Housing Commission Board to actually write the city of Atlanta's um, recommendations for the Housing Trust Fund. Now that's the allocation of funds. Also back to the Housing Help Center that we did not have before now, but now we have been influential in creating the Housing Help Center where it is a office where tenants can go that need help for um, understanding the legal process um, that goes into evictions, understanding um, and getting resources if they need resources for you know housing or health care or education but a centralized location um for for us to actually have these resources and you know be able to continuously uh build in our communities so understanding policy policy um helps allocate funding based on demographics based on where you live so we have the ability as as tenant leaders, as organizers, where you are to collectively gather with your community, collectively listen to the concerns that are going on, but not only just using your voice to share your pain, share your story, but actually being influential in that. Um, I have actually, Sid has a slide, I sent a slide in for you guys to be able to see. And of course we can share it in the process of creating um, a, a resolution or ordinance and um yeah so the sorry i didn't know which slide it was on. i'm <laughs> sorry it's okay but yeah so understanding that all of the concerns that we have as far as you know i can't reach anyone my house is you know i have flooding no one is listening where's the landlord where's the funding where's the resources but all of your concerns can actually go into a formulation of a bill the bill then goes to become an ordinance with the help of a city council member and with a vote, a unanimous vote from the city council, that, that is how it is in Atlanta, um, the, the ordinance then becomes a resolution. So understanding that we don't have to continuously share our pain without having a productive outcome. Um, and understanding that policy governs everything, like legislation governs everything. And I know in our brown communities, um, our black communities, we have a stigma that voting um, does not matter. And voting is just like saying your voice. So as long as you continuously, you know, sit at home and you continue to allow other people to make decisions and make laws and make policies and bills and ordinances about your life, your quality of life, you know, then we're doomed to continuously be in a cycle where we are subjected to inequities, inequities in healthcare, inequities in education, you know, and then it's a lack of accountability, even for us as the people to actually hold our elected officials responsible for providing the services that these funds are actually allocated for in our communities. Um, see, you can change the slide if you. So how to effectively, how to write effective city legislation. This is just a crash course on the basics of 
understanding, you know, how to formalize a bill. And there is a lot of research that goes into this, but partnering with your city council, partnering with other agencies within your area that are actually productively moving, you know, on the areas of your concern or that needs for your community is like important. And then research, if there is something that you're not familiar with or you're not, you know, really, really well aware of, then do the research, you know, come out of your comfort zone. Don't allow all of the negative um, stereotypes that society have about what it looks like to be, you know, successful, stop you from actually using your voice. I mean, if you don't know, someone will teach you. And that's why it's important for us as advocates and organizers, like I said, to be impactful, to make a difference because I started just in, in my, my low income apartment and the concern and the fight was just getting HUD to listen to us from the very beginning. But from that, I've understood and I've grown as a leader to understand the impact of policy because policy controls funding. See, you can go to the next slide. Oh, wow. So my things didn't show, but um, on this slide, it was, I will send it to see it in the PDF form, but it actually showed um, the actual links from legislation from when we first started actually creating um, the Senate Bill of Rights. It's links and it's online, so it's public information. The first draft of the Senate Working Group creating the Senate Bill of Rights, and it actually shows the link of what it looked like in when it became a actual resolution for the city of Atlanta. So I will make sure that see it. Um, actually, we you guys can be able to get those actual links to be able to actually see to model. And I'm always here. Reach out, cross organization, us reaching out, us partnering, us talking to other leaders, talking to other you know tenants in other cities, other states, just comparing notes and collaboratively collaboratively building um is influential in our advocacy you can go to the next one see. hopefully i don't know if they show I know, but this I is there was an oh i'm so sorry i was gonna say i think there's another image on here but it's just the formatting of the pdf but i have like another version of this that i can share okay. but it hasn't <laughs> well it's fine um but this is a quote um just when i was in trust tree we actually formed our tennis association we had meetings we researched our, our legal rights as HUD tenants and we reached out to our, our neighbors. Sometimes, you know, your neighbors don't even realize what you're going through. If you're, because we were behind the gate in one of the most, you know, the largest, most nicest neighborhood. We were in a uh, located near Grant, in Grant Park where the houses right next door to us are $450,000, $350,000 homes. And we were only, our stigma of how society or the city of Atlanta knew the apartment complex was from for drug and, and, and you know things that were drug violence and gang violence and someone else you know being shot out there. So using our voice got the attention of our neighbors and they actually joined the fight. So don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to you know tell people what it is that you're going through because as long as you live in silence those are the tools that you know keep us you know keep us in a in a state of oppression so this is one of the quotes that i came up with for our tennis association our foundation is unity our strength is knowledge our voice applies the pressure unified we have limitless power and that's the truth we are the builders we hold the blueprint inside of us stop allowing other people to make decisions about your quality of life you you are the stakeholder. So I just just as tell everybody, like, don't allow society to make you feel small. You know, my thing when I first started was one law voice can make a difference. And you want to look back and you want to see programs that come from your pain. You want to see resources, you know, allocated to programs that, you know, we really need them in. So the, the, the platform or, or the space that you get to connect with people and build because we're building. I, I was just in a place where I was tired, you know, and I really used my voice and understood like you can make a difference. Society makes us feel 
Like we can't, but you really can. So I encourage everyone to look past where you at. You know, don't allow society or the world to tell you like you can't do something, you know? And policy controls everything. Policy controls funding. Law controls everything. If we don't have laws in place that represent our quality of life, it represents the needs in our community, what type of future will our children have? So please, if anyone wants to reach out to me right now, we have started Georgia HAT, which is the Georgia Housing Accountability Task Force, where we are organizing tenants to push for rent stabilization for our state, for House Bill 404. And um, I share the links with Sid, sign our petition, share it, reach out. You can email me. Um, we'll have that information sent. And I just want to connect because we that's what it is going to take. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miracle. That was really, really inspiring. And you're getting a lot of love in the chat, including from your own daughter, who's also joining the call today. Um, but yeah, we did have like, I think one or two questions come into the chat, but folks feel free to keep dropping questions in the chat. We'll use the remaining 20-ish uh, minutes that we have to go through um, the call. And um, I forgot to copy and paste it, but we'll copy and paste this email here. Um, in the chat for you all so that you have Miracle's email on here. But yeah. Um, oh, hold on, let me stop sharing my screen. I just realized I'm still sharing. Okay, so Miracle, I think the, the first question um, that I saw was mostly around just like, um, we had some people ask questions about organizing in general, which I know is a little different from what you were just talking about, but if there's any like technical assistance or any resources that you think are helpful for people to know about when they're organizing groups like this, that would be super helpful. Um, it is just chiming in um, around organization. Um, one of the biggest things I think that we did um, when we were in Trussell Tree was we were very consistent. We were consistent with our research. We were consistent with holding accountability to, you know, our, the people that were running our leasing office and we were consistent and just our, our fight, our struggle. So my advice would be to understand organizational structure, because what I've found is a lot of times people that are, that have lived experience like me, you and everyone else on this call of whether it's homelessness, domestic violence, whatever the case may be, um, we are, our stories, we share our stories. And, and it, there's nothing wrong with sharing your story, but we have to understand that sometimes we are in positions of exploitation. So understand that you're exploited sometimes. They dangle a carrot, hey, we wanna interview you. Yes, yes, they have a story to tell, but at the same time, what is my story going to lead to? Like, what is what am I complaining or I am addressing issues that I'm, I'm having in my community, but how is it going to change something? So reading and understanding organizational structure, understanding the democratic process that goes into, you know, forming a group or being a part of a board or being a part of an organization is the first key piece um, that I think, you know, is very influential in, in the success of you forming an organization. Cross organization is the biggest tool because resources that you may not have, resources or information that you may not necessarily have at your disposal when you're in these places and you're in these group settings with other people, you have an endless amount of knowledge and resources to pull from. So that's those are some just nuggets and um, understanding language and word justice, language justice is is very, very another tool to use because we all, we speak English, but it's different versions. Um, I'm from down South, so I have a country, you know, a country accent. So everything, you know, for me is not always, you know, but even with that, you know, us listening and us listening for understanding to what someone else is sharing and listening to be able to grow from that is what I think can be good for organization. Um, well, we have um, some questions coming in too. Um, 
And I know you might not be able to answer all of them. So I do encourage like folks who have like more direct assistance type of questions to reach out to us at um, outreach at nlhc.org. Um, and we'll be able to connect you with some additional resources there. But um, I did want to ask you, Miracle, a question that I asked Zella in her interview as well, which was kind of connected to to just like being a part of the experience of being a commissioner for the first time and like what surprised you being in that um, system or like in that institution? <clears throat> the one thing that actually surprised me was the lack of the public involvement. You know what I mean? The lack, and then our housing commission board is one of the newest boards created. So the fact that we don't have a direct, you know, a direct way to connect with the actual public, like for community engagement was one of the red flags for me, because if I am a person, you know, I'm coming in as a low income tenant and I'm coming into the commission board, but I'm saying, hey, before I actually started this advocacy, even in, in Trussell Tree, us planning, we never knew that the board was even in existence. And it, and it has been in existence, I think, since 2018. So that was one of the main things that I found. And then also understanding, like, what it means to be a stakeholder, you know, and understanding what goes into that process of creating bills and developing, you know, land development projects and the allocation of funding. Um, but, yeah, so I seen that there was not a direct connection between us and the public and there is a greater need for that because when I'm invited to certain meetings and I'm invited to certain workshops and platforms there are many stakeholders there and stakeholders are the business investments like the transportation companies um any nonprofit organization or agency for-profit private entity these are stakeholders these are the people that is are going to receive the funding that comes down the federal funding to implement you know, projects. So none of us are at the table. None of us are at like the in these places. So in my mind, I feel like we have to create more spaces for us where we share, where we build um, within our communities for ourselves. But it's just a lack of that, you know, that back and forth that we're, we're building rapport, we're building a team, you know, and this is what's really going on. So we need to get at these tables. We need to be there when they're making the decisions. Go to your city council meeting. It is public notice on your city's website when they host their meetings. Go down there for budget, not just for housing. Go for budget and planning. Go for zoning to even understand the process of like what goes into creating new um, land developments. Zoning is a major issue um, that you know, we that has been a barrier for us here. We just got zoning rights now for the city to create, you know, shipping container homes and tiny homes here. But just use every resource at your disposal and awareness. You know, they say insanity, the definition of insanity is repeating the same thing, expecting something different. If you continue to sit in your house, if you continue to call your friends and you talking to them about, you know, my roof, it's the bird sitting in my living room. Rats are eating up all the food that I have. The people that make the decisions are not in your living room. They're not in your house. So putting pressure on them. My hashtag is don't complain, make them explain. The fight is in black and white. If you want to fight, if you want to make a difference, create a law that will allow you to get funds allocated for your programs for your community if you want to be impactful. That is how you become, you know, uh, uh, influential in creating something that is going to be sustainable for our low-income communities. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so I see, um, I'm going to like cover one question in the chat and then I'll go to Mrs. Brown and then I'll cover another <laughs> question in the chat, but um, I know Tiffany left some really good comments in the chat, um, just asking a little bit more about like nonprofits. And I don't know if you have like, you know, in your coalition or um, like in your network, working as a nonprofit, like how you funded um, that work, or if you know how they funded their work. I think that's like something so, that's trying to cross a lot. So, and 
the North Star Inc. Because we are, I am creating my nonprofit now, um, North Star Inc. But uh, my consulting agency is the Underground Way because we have the ability to take our lived experience and create the stuff that we know we need. So there are part of the the concept be of the North Star is for us, people with lived experience, to take our experience and build, whether it is us investing in one another, like iron sharper iron, we're bartering, whether it's a skill, whether it's a service that you have, and us building our nonprofits, building our LLCs to offer support in our community. So there is, um, I do have some resources that I can share on how to form, because this, I'm going through this process now, how to actually legally formalize your 501c3 and um, in um, some information in how to actually formalize an actual grant to apply for federal funding these are the type of resources and trainings and workshops you know on top of housing like i tell everyone like i am everywhere housing may be my my platform that i'm on as far as a commissioner but i am interconnected with education programs um right now i'm working on a project um with building and partnering with um, Grace Weave in Savannah to create something for ocean, ocean awareness and um, energy conservation. And so it's so many, don't put yourself in a box, you know. As a parent, you know, I have a child, you know, my, my children going to school, like I had to understand how to advocate and be the voice of my child, you know, because my, 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 my one of my children had suffered with disabilities. So understanding the process of creating a 504 plan or advocating for an IEP for your school system or for your children, don't put yourself in a box because I can't talk about housing without talking about healthcare, education, prison reform, you name it. Because everything all ties into the health and benefit of us as a person, you as an individual, and us as a community. So come out your box. Meet everybody, even if it's something that you don't know. Try it. Just step out. Like, face your fear. So first and foremost, our mind, we're very conditioned. I was afraid when I was in Trussell Tree. I was afraid. Why? Because I was going to lose my housing. And that was how, you know... And, and the lack of me not knowing my rights kept me disadvantaged. But when I learned my rights, guess what? I faced my fear. My voice led me to be able to be on a platform to be influential in creating something for other people that are just like me. So if I can do it, we all can. And together, if we build collectively, we will not be stopped. There is no boundaries, no barriers that we can, you know, that are set for us. Because we have to actually take back. Because look at all the money. Right now, the state of Georgia, has, HUD just allocated $58 million for the state of Georgia. So who is going to be able to oversee that our people in our communities, especially our people that, you know, are very, that are, low, you know, low in income, that have, you know, real real disabilities that prevent them from actually doing everything who's going to make sure that they're receiving those wraparound services because last time i checked the agencies are awarded the funding but it's limited and no oversight on how it's being allocated because we got to create that for ourselves so i challenge all of my organizers and leaders on this call i challenge you I challenge you to hold elected officials accountable. I challenge you to keep fighting a system that is not designed for you to be successful. Don't be bound by what society say. Take every negative stereotype, stereotype and stand on it. Build from it. Take your lived experience and move something. You can. We are powerful combined. Thank you. Thank you, Miracle. That was really, really, really powerful. And I think a lot of the people in the chat agree. I really appreciate the multi-sector approach too. I'll take it to Mrs. Brown and then I'll have Monica um, share their question too. Thank you, Sid. Miracle, thank you so much. I really appreciate your presentation. Thank and your you. knowledge that you're passing on because it's critical that we all show up at city council meetings, school board meetings, uh, different public platforms. And for those who have 
a tenant association, uh, start a reading uh, committee within your association, whereby you the reading committee will be responsible for reading the legislation that's put out by HUD or other housing agencies that address tenant rights and uh, give you contact for pro bono services for lawyers if legal aid isn't in your town. And also as another source, your local news stations, they usually allow community calendars where you can say, come meet with us, tenant rights, you have a concern, and then say, you know, uh, grocery uh, giveaways or, or, or grocery cards, because your local groceries, I don't know what chains are in your respective cities. If you approach them and let them know that you have a tenant organization, low-income people, would they donate maybe 100 or $200 worth of um, grocery gift cards? And those can be given away to entice people to come. Or if they have to go to the laundromat, a lot of laundromats will give out gift cards just to bring people in, to get a new audience. So there are different ways to bring people into a meeting. But um, I think it's, it's, it's critical to have PSA messages. I think it's important to involve your local officials because politics are local and you might not hear from them until it's time for them to be reelected. So you go to their offices and say, I need this, I need that. Can you put me in contact with someone? Can you help me set up this? And, and believe me, they will be available to you. But keep up the fight. I am just so proud of you, young lady. You're doing a, a, a wonderful job. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I send those blessings back to each and every one of us on this call. We are all great. We are all great. There is no, no one on this call that is not valued. You are loved, you are valued, and you deserve the best. We do. We all do. We deserve to have equity in our communities. We deserve to have a healthy and safe quality of life for all of us. Well, we have a board member in, in, in Georgia, Dr. Bambi Hayes-Brown. She will be an excellent contact for you two to get together because she's doing great things as well. She is amazing and I love her. <laughs> yeah, they're both, we, we have some trailblazers out there in Georgia, um, but thank you for those those kind words for Miracle Mrs. B. Um, it's really good to just like see like up and coming leaders too, just connecting. Yes. with elders it's really heartwarming <laughs> um I was gonna say um oh so the last question um hopefully we have question and time for another one but um I know Monica Delancey had some comments in the chat just talking about her personal experience running for office and I don't know if you had like a question or comment Monica that you wanted to share oh no I was just commenting Miracle did a great job presenting um I just want to comment when uh, we were stating how renters um, should be at the table, how we could be a part of the the uh, the process, the decision making process. So I was just referencing that when we do try to be a part of the decision making process, uh, we have so much coming against us, especially running for office. We're outspent, and then when we're outspent, um, people come up against us because they do stereotype us, they do try to label us, and the number one reason why we are making strides in Cobb County, I'm not speaking of renters, is because of the grassroots campaign I'm able to do and have and have um, um, significant results. But I just wanted to state that, but you know, at least we're putting ourselves on the ballot and showing that we can do it, but of course we're gonna get out spent. I'd rather spend money on my children, making sure the children have books, making sure the children have food, I can't spend money on buying signs because I truly can't eat signs. But again, thank you, Miracle. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mon 
<laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Miracle, as well. Um, I think we'll probably end it here for today just to make sure that we leave on time. But again, thank you so much, everybody, for your questions. And thank you, Miracle, for being so, so thoughtful um, in your answers and providing us with so much wisdom. And thank you to Zola Knight, who, oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. No, I was just saying thank you to everybody. Thank you for just, you know, National Low Income for actually giving us a space and a platform to share, to build, and to connect because that's that's it. That's our power to, you know, it's like when you're sick, you got to go to the hospital. FYI, the federal budget book is the Bible now. That is for organizers. You got to understand your funding, how the funding, follow the pipeline of funding in your city, in your state, and hold accountability, whether it's any stakeholder, for the things that they are going to provide, that they are getting federal funding for. So thank y'all for having me. And thank you, Zella. Thank yes, you, Zella. Thank you. thank you to Zella Knight, who wasn't able to be here with us live, but uh, you know she's, she's always great and has a lot of wisdom to share again and then um we had a question in the chat just asking if you need to register again um if you've attended one of these calls before you should get emails um that'll send you like a reminder but you shouldn't have to register again uh but yeah just a few reminders before we log off today our next tenant talk live will be on march 4th um we're only going to be doing once a month tenant talk lives for the foreseeable future um, and the next topic will be around bridging the gap between communities and uh, agencies. And you can register for that with the link that Courtney just dropped in the chat a few minutes ago. Um, and then as always, we're always looking for folks who wanna contribute to our blog on the home front. So if you are inspired by this and wanna share your story, um, feel free to email outreach at nlhc.org and they'll be able to help you out with some of the um, guidelines for that. And then also, um, please do not forget to join our Facebook group. We do have a Facebook group if y'all have um, a profile there and you can connect with one another after this is over. Um, and as always, if you have any questions or want to provide any suggestions for future tenant talk lives, please feel free to email me um, and we'll drop my email in the chat as well. And also, Sid, if there is if there's anybody on the call who are not members of the coalition, please, yes. please, please join. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. B. That is a good reminder. Um, and you know, you're you're welcome to join as an organization as well. So if you are a tenant union or tenant association, you're also welcome to join as an organizational member. And if you're low, if you're low income, it's only three dollars a year, individual. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. B. All right. Have a good um, evening, Thanks. everybody, and we'll see you in March. Bye, oh, everybody. Bye. Stay safe. Thank you, Miracle. I desire just to pay my bill. I said. <laughs> <laughs>